Hello and welcome to the Keep Right On podcast. We're both back this week to talk about the big win against Rotherham United on Saturday where Blues extended their League One winning streak to five matches and extended their away winning run to four games. They've now equaled their total number of away victories for the whole of last season in all competitions. Brian, uh, I guess you can't be anything other than happy after that weekend, can you? No, I mean, I was slightly grumpy when I saw the um, saw the weather conditions up there and you were basking in the sunshine while the rest of the country was getting washed away. Uh, but no, absolutely not. Uh, too tricky. A week with two very tricky games on paper and Blues have summarily dismissed both opponents, which I'm sure we'll come on to. Uh, so yeah, we're starting to get to the point where expectations are just starting to be exceeded for me anyway. Yeah, I mean, on the game itself, that that first half was just absolutely outstanding. Um, to be fair to Rotherham, they started well first five minutes. Um, you know, had a couple of set pieces. I think Ben Davis straight away knew the battle he was in for when Rotherham kind of launched it onto the head of Johnson Clark Harris right next to him. Um, but Blues really settled themselves down after five minutes. A lovely little touch from Willem Willemson, a little nutmeg in, in midfield, kind of just settled those nerves and Next thing you know, Blues are playing some of the most swashbuckling football league one has ever seen. Um, two great goals, pretty pretty similar goals, actually. Chris Davis analysed them afterwards. And when, when you think about it, they were very similar goals in that Jay Stansfield made the run in behind for both of them after Lino and Darks had dropped off. First one, he didn't quite get the shot on target because it was blocked and obviously fell to a water and he finished brilliantly. And then the second one, he did get in behind and, you know, the finish was absolutely superb. Blues could have had... Four or five, I think, if they kept their foot down for the whole game. But, you know, it wasn't to be. They didn't run away with it in that way, but it was so comfortable. Yeah, it's so what we were saying when we were talking about Dykes when he first signed, is that, yes, he's got this sort of appearance and demeanour and almost reputation as a big lumbering target man. But when he even when he was at QPR, he did drop in and allowed runners to go beyond. Uh, and, you know, that's quite a, a tried and tested old tactic, isn't it? I saw Nottingham Forest do that against... Uh, Brighton yesterday when Chris Wood dropped in and, and they sent runners in against Dunk uh, and the other centre-back whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but yeah, we'll come on to Dyke's, Dyke's um, full debut, won't we, in a second. But you can just see, and I think this is what inspires most confidence, is you can see the attacking patterns that are clearly being worked out in, the, in training. Uh, being brought to bear and you know bear fruit in matches as well so yeah really encouraging from that point of view definitely we're so familiar with that style now aren't we the, the three five two in possession um and you know the the four two three one out of possession it worked so brilliantly for, for the both for both goals i mean the second one especially you know the way tally garden hitman held the position played it back to william williamson who was in space and the the clip over the top was just absolutely sublime so um yeah, two, re two really good goals, a really good Blues performance. Um, you know, we could sit here and talk about it all day, but I don't think people want us to do that. Uh, Brian, you you afterwards, I didn't have the pleasure of going into uh, to Steve Evans' press conference because Blues did their media pitch side, so I was too busy doing that. But I know you picked up what, what Evans had said. Um, before the game, he'd referred to Blues as, you know, Rail Birmingham, the Galacticos of League One. Um, and he was pretty complimentary post-match as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he described Blues as the best ever League One club. And I actually think that's a podcast in itself. And, it is. You know, maybe we'll try and get some guests on to discuss that. Uh, at the risk of being called, uh, you know, big time Charlies or putting the cart before the horse because Blues aren't promoted yet. Um, but yeah, it is an interesting debate. Uh, when I put those uh, quotes into the public domain, uh, I was immediately contacted by, like within 30 seconds by somebody from Ipswich saying, oh, calm down. Uh, Steve Steve Evans always says that about any team that that he's his side has just been beaten by, uh, you know, get back in the box a little bit. So, I mean, yeah, Steve Evans is going to big up the team that's just played his side off the park, yeah. isn't he? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we mentioned last week, didn't we? We felt like he was getting his excuses in early. Maybe he could see what's coming, and that doesn't mean to say that you know it is just excuses he clearly recognised that his Rotherham team were going to be up against a side with, you know, a much greater depth of quality. Uh, and what was pleasing this time, actually, was the way they just took control of the game in the first half. And it wasn't the case of 
you know, them having to rely on running the legs out of a side and overwhelming them in the second. It was just an assertive front foot after five or ten minutes, as you said. Assertive front foot dominant first half performance that just basically, you know, said, uh, you know, is this a potential banana skin? Just sidestepped it and we move on. So, yeah, uh, Evans was very complimentary. He's been complimentary all the way through this, you know, the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if uh, we get something similar out of, Pe- out of Peterborough, whether whether it's um, Darren McAntony or or Darren Ferguson or Barry Fry. Uh, you wouldn't it wouldn't be surprising if that narrative carries on this week. Brian, I think it'd be it'd be wrong not to uh, highlight Willem Williamson the performance that he, he put in against Rotherham. I think we've been waiting for him to really take off in a blue shirt, haven't we? And he was just sublime some of the touches i mentioned the little nutmeg in midfield earlier that i thought would settle blues down but the pass to stansfield for that goal as well and not just that some of the positions he got himself into in the second half you know good players always seem to have time don't they and, and williamson always seemed to have time and he just had such grace with the ball um we you, you must now think we're starting to see the best of him and that must be i suppose as well due to the fact that he's kind of shaken off that little that little injury he had at the start of the season and end of pre-season and has got himself into the team and he's now a fixture without the competition that luke harris provided in the early weeks yeah it was interesting what chris davis said about that though wasn't it you, you know you asked him a question and i was expecting him to wax lyrical about his technical ability mm. and his and his vision uh, but it was actually his work rate and and positioning without the ball that Davis spoke sort of most glowingly about uh, and we have seen that clearly and, and I sort of have noticed that I think I've noticed it more for him losing a couple of tackles in the centre circle that have left Blues vulnerable um, you know we, sh- we should praise him for being there and I thought oh, does he need to be a little bit more physical sometimes out of possession um, but Davis really highlighted the, the work that he's doing when Blues don't have the ball um, but he you know he'll be paid for and was brought to the club for what for the ability that he does have when when blues are in possession and you know i went on twitter and people have teased me about my man crush um for the for the backspin that he put on the pass to stansfield um i actually thought you know there was there was another very elegant moment as well in the first half uh just in the build-up to when emil hansen hit the post and he just he, he took the ball in quite a tight space close to the left touch line and he worked himself an angle just to set Hansen away uh, and yeah I just that was what some of what we saw in pre-season that appreciation of space and, and it's the weight of pass again wasn't it you know the, the one at Wickham uh, that put Alf, Alfie May in behind and he ended up scoring himself uh, it's, it's just that weight of pass that you know I, I really really enjoy and, uh, you know, I think when we come on to some of the quotes and takes, somebody's mentioned about how does Luke Harris get back into this, mm. into that role when he's fit. You know, I think Luke Harris will uh, because of because of what Davis has said about Luke Harris. Mm. Um, but, yeah, Williamson is looking a cut above at the moment. Uh, not just Williamson, to be fair. But, yeah, I'm... Uh, you made him. Was it? Did you make him man of the match? Did. And and Davis yeah. also after the game spoke about you know he wants him to score more goals. Obviously he hasn't. He's only scored one so far, but he has also got two assists. Brian and in our preseason predictions, I'd Willemson as my uh, as my top assist maker, didn't I? So I'm quite happy about that. Two. He's not. He's not. He's not running away with it, but at least he's at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, two mighty number. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ethan Laird could when he gets back, he could potentially run him close as well. Um, yeah. But- yeah, absolutely. It, the the number 10 currency is goals and assists, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Um, Lyndon Dykes played as centre forward and did it quite well, as we've already mentioned. Um, Brian, obviously that there was some there was there was a reason why Alfie May was left out of the eleven, or part of a reason, because he was he was ill for a little bit in the in the week leading up to the game, didn't train completely. So it probably Going to Rotherham as well and knowing what a physical side they are, it probably just made Chris Davis' decision a little bit easier. And he, you know, put the guy who's six foot two and more of a physical presence in the 11 rather than the guy who's five foot eight. Yeah, you went with that, didn't you, in your predicted yeah. side uh, bef- before the match suggested that the, you know, Rotherham's aerial approach would probably mean that Dykes comes into, came into the side. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, th- I thought he did well. He, I think he won six aerials. Um, 
which was as many as any Rotherham player won that day. Mm. Um, and it was, you know, he he was he it was dropping off as well, wasn't it? As well as sort of, you know, going straight up against the back four and and wrestling them. Or was it a back four? Or was it was a back three they played, wasn't it? Uh, it started as a back three, and they did go. To yeah, the back four. Oh, yeah. Oh. Thought they changed, yeah. Um, so yeah, I was impressed. Um, what I mean, what did what did you make of him uh, overall? I thought his link play was really good, back to goal, yeah. excellent. Yeah, May and Stansfield aren't strikers that are going to necessarily thrive playing back to goal, are they? But Dykes clearly is. He's got the frame for it. The build touch was really good. The way Blues play, particularly down the right in the first half, it kind of lent itself to Dykes going across and taking a position over there, so that you know he could just kind of lay it off to a Willemson or lay off into a water in midfield and then could spin and go from there. Um, it also really worked well with Stansfield because he didn't really have to fight Dykes for that kind of position when Blues were in possession. Dykes was more than happy to drop off and, and give Stansfield kind of the the licence to go and play up against the centre-backs and kind of use that that those runs and that intelligence of runs that Chris Davis has been talking about spinning behind. And lo and behold, the two goals came from that. So uh, I think he worked and dovetailed really well with, with Stansfield and you know, Dykes is a player who's scored 30-odd goals at championship level, played 150 games in the championship over the last three, four years. So, you know, again, he's another player who's probably not come to league one to sit on the bench every week. And, you know, Blues have got a plethora of options. But Dykes, I think, will get enough game time this season just to the selection and the signing. More of a natural fit for Jay, do you think? Um, I don't know, because Stansfield scored twice against Wrexham when he was playing with May. And those two did look like they had a better understanding in that game. I do think it's more of a natural fit with Stansfield. That's what I will say. Because yeah. we know that Alfie May wants to be in the positions that Stansfield has been taken up, whereas Dykes didn't seem to be, you know, as interested in taking up those roles. He was quite happy to play second fiddle to Stansfield. Mm. I wonder if Dykes should have scored from that corner. It's a, it's a difficult angle, isn't it? Yeah, I think it just got away from him, to be honest. He did really well to read it. Um, yeah the Rotherham goalkeeper less so and he, you know it's just whether you can divert it direct it on target from that angle it just it was too tight like with any score any striker you just want that first goal don't you to get mm. them up and running and yeah good stuff from Dykes uh, you know he's clearly ahead of Duke in terms of the in terms of the the four attack centre forwards that Blues have got yeah. now so, so yeah promising stuff and as you say he'll get plenty more uh, opportunities this season wouldn't surprise me if May was back in against Peterborough, but you know, I'm sure we'll come on to that later in the week. Yeah, definitely. I think he probably will be. Um, the other player who came into the eleven, uh, Ben Davis. Obviously, I think we both both mentioned previously that he didn't really impress at his on his first start against Warsaw in the Bristol Street Motors Trophy at the beginning of this month. Um, it felt like he really had to take the chance against Rotherham, and to be fair, Brian, he did. Yeah, he lo looked a lot better, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, really, really good. Solid, as I mentioned earlier, you know, first involvement in the game. Uh, Rotherham kick off, they, they pass it back to the midfielder. You know, three or four big guys running in Ben Davies' direction. Johnson Clark Harris jumps in front of him to win the first aerial challenge. And you just thought that's, he obviously, that's the afternoon he's going to be in for. But, you know, what he, he really composed himself, was dominant aerially. And on the floor, he was actually better than I thought he was going to be. Really good at playing out. Obviously slotted into that role in the middle of Alex Cochran and Christoph Clara when Blues are in possession and, and you know, played some really, really smart passes into midfield and got a water and peck moving forward. So a really good performance from him. Speaking to him afterwards, he, he was under no illusions that he had to play well and had to have a good game to kind of keep himself as the, the next cab off the rank almost. I don't think he's expecting to start the game against Peterborough. I think we're probably all expecting Christian Beard to come straight back in because of how important he is to, to the way that Blues play. But Davis has done himself the world of good and he's probably not done Dion Sanderson any favours. Yeah, probably as big a compliment as you can pay him is the fact that Bielik wasn't missed. No, 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 he wasn't. He wasn't at all. Um, and I think we all thought he would go. I mean, that was, that was Blue's first League One clean sheet of the season, wasn't it? So, uh, you know, can you... It, it feels harsh to go and change a defence that has kept a clean sheet, especially against uh, a very, you know, on paper, a decent Rotherham attack and also on paper, a, a team that we all expect to be competing for promotion against Blues this season. Um, but Bielik, I've said a couple of times, he is that guy. He's probably the only 
undroppable. I think when he's when he's fit and when he's available, he's going to play. So I'd be surprised if Davis kept his place, but it does feel harsh. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, you know, Mark Leonard is is suffering from yeah. the harsh competition, isn't he? And you know, and Dykes has suffered, and Alfie May took he was turned to to take a spell out the on Saturday. Yoki Armour's not even getting in the squad. It is. It's a harsh environment, isn't it? And you know, hopefully, you know, I think we might be coming onto the competition for places with with some of the questions and takes. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully, you know, Davis can manage that because we think you know potentially that is one one of the bigger the bigger issues. Uh, speaking about Alfie May, um, he was left out, and he was. You asked Davis about that, didn't you? And, and he, he mentioned he had a cold. Is that right? Yeah, he said he had a, a, a cold in the in the week leading up to the game. So again, like I said earlier, it probably just kind of. Made it a little bit easier for Davis to leave him out and go go down the Dykes route. Um, you know, like, like you said earlier, I think he'll probably be back in for that Peterborough game. Peterborough don't strike me as a team that are massively direct and you need four or five, six foot plus players in the 11. I think Blues will be more comfortable playing their football against against Peterborough and Peter probably wants it to be that type of game. So I think he'll come back in for that. But but yeah, that was the reason. Um, interestingly, he did actually take the captain's armband from Clara, I think when he came on, um, I'm sure I saw saw him with it with it on his arm towards the end, and obviously Clara didn't go, so he must have um, an interesting point on on the uh, on the captaincy because I I wasn't expecting it to be Clara, to be honest, Brian. I, I thought he might go for Peck, um, just because of kind of longevity. He's the he's the long he was the longest serving player in the uh, in the eleven on uh, on Saturday. And he joined the club six months ago, so that kind of says about the, a lot about the transformation that Blues have gone through. Um, I thought he'd probably go for Peck, but I did see him have a quiet word with Clara um, not long after the players had come out onto the pitch for their kind of pre-game amble walk, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, it looked like he was kind of telling that he was going to be the captain for the day. So, uh, so yeah, Clara again, excellent player, but yeah, it looked like May took it on for the uh, the final ten minutes or whatever he was on the field plus stoppages. Yeah, I don't know what kind of personality Clara is behind the scenes, whether he's that big voice, but certainly when he's on, on the pitch, you know, he plays like a real leader, if only physically, doesn't he? You know, he really takes takes charge of, of the situation. You know, he's often the one playing playing the ball out. Um and I think if I think you're right, I think May did get the armband and that's probably a measure of his you know, his the way he's standing in the, mm. in the in the squad and in the training room, because we know he is a, a chirpy little chappy, and you know he probably is qu- quite a big voice or a, a loud voice in in that dressing room. So, and it's goes back to what I said earlier about managing, you, you know the the different agendas that all pl- that players will have, in the, you know wanting to look after their own careers, and you know it's just a nice little show of respect. To show that Alfie May still is central to to, to what's happening and, and the way Davis sees him. Um, Alex, you wrote a piece. Your first, I was slightly surprised actually. Your first quotes piece when it came through um, wasn't about the performance or you know another goal for Stansfield. Mm. It was it was about Chris Davis going to the away fans and giving giving it the the, the old fist pumps. What it was um it was an interesting selection what what, yeah. what why why did that stand out to you yeah just because i mean uh, we we've spoken in the week as well about Awata and Stansfield scoring goals i've spoken to him again about Stansfield at i think the pre rex and press conference i've spoken to him about Awata at pre rotherham press conference it felt like i was kind of killing him on Awata and Stansfield questions yeah um there are a couple of others obviously the may thing i came out with quite quickly afterwards as well because i just thought that was important yeah. um but yeah just just the fact that i mean i know it's kind of this whole idea of like celebrating properly after winning at Charlton, after winning at Wickham, Leighton Orient, um, God, uh, Rotherham, I feel, almost forgot who Blues played on Saturday. Um, you know, Blues took a little bit of stick, didn't they, on social media at the start of the season um, for, for, for like posting videos from of Davis celebrating so, so hard with, with the fans after these games. And uh, I just wanted to kind of, you know, it wasn't really actually like led in that way. It was more me asking him about kind of, 
just just kind of alluding to the fact that he seems to be really enjoying it and enjoying the the celebrations with fans after the games and also the players do as well because after Davies had done that, Stansfield and May did it as well, I think, because uh, normally Christian Bielik does it and they, I think there was someone trying to push Clara towards it, but he didn't quite go for it. Um, so it's just, it's becoming a theme and it's part of the feel good factor, isn't it? And, and David just said, you know, why not? Why not kind of enjoy celebrating with fans after games, especially when, you know, the team had a really hard time last year, has had a hard time for the last yeah. decade, hasn't won many games on the road. You know, I mentioned it earlier, won four game away games in the whole of last season. And one of those was at Cheltenham Town in the Carabao Cup first round. So, you know, it's not a team that's been used to win on the road. So when they do win, why not celebrate? You know, it's pretty simple, isn't it? You might as well enjoy a win because they're hard to come by a lot of the time. I don't think they're going to be as hard to come by the Blues this season. And we're going to be celebrating a lot, I think. But, um, you know, when Blues get back into the Championship, it won't be as easy. If they get to the Premier League, then it'll be even harder. But um, why not enjoy a win? There he is. Flouting his when again. <laughs> <laughs> There's absolutely no doubt in your mind, is there? Um, no, I, I liked his comments because... You know, it was he made a reference to the fact that fans haven't had much to celebrate around, mm. you know, for the last ten years, and you know that showed an understanding of the situation that and that he was walking into. Um, and for me, yes, you know, yes, it's a bit cloppy, isn't it? But it's not going to grow old, you know. If it means Blues of Blues have won away again, or you know, or won at home, you know, wherever wherever they win, I'm all for it. You know, you know, I'm. Yeah, I have absolutely no issues with it at all, you know, and, and I do think that on social media, you know, there's going to be a lot of a lot of criticism, jealous, jealousy-laced criticism aimed at Blues, isn't there? So, you know, if, if that's what they've got to go at, look at the way you're celebrating winning away from home, you know, bring it on, I say. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think didn't Klopp celebrate one of the first first games at Liverpool at Anfield? Didn't he celebrate a two two draw with Tony Pulis Albion or something? Yeah, it was a West Brom one. That's no. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I'll be for it if Chris Davies does that after a two two draw with <laughs> with buddy, you know, Cambridge or something. But but I don't. Gary, think Gary Monk's Cambridge. Um, Gary yeah. Monk's Cambridge, which brings us on to celebrators. Blues have got some <laughs> some of their players. The way they celebrate, I'm, I can't use the word. There's a bit of s housery going on, isn't there? <laughs> you know, Stansfield scored, and yes, he's at the end where the Rotherham fans are, but he stands there and you know, and he's he's staring at the Rotherham fans. Taylor Gardner Hickman jumps on his back. You know, they're unapo- unapologetic celebrators. Mm. This this bunch, aren't they? They are, and Stansfield had that in him last season as well, didn't he? He's he's, yeah. he's done that quite a bit. He. He seems to, uh, you know, for someone, I wouldn't say, you know, when you speak to Stansfield, he's not the like the loudest, most kind of loudest person in the room. He's not the most, he doesn't come across the most confident person in the room. I'll say he's confident himself, but he's quite, a, quite in the way he delivers his messages. Yeah. Um, well, I will say I think he's a really good talker. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't strike you as that kind of, um, you know, extrovert character who would celebrate that way. But, you know, he, he did it last season. He's, He's done it again this season. He seems to kind of be thriving under that pressure of being League One's costliest ever player, having opposition fans having a pop at him every week, you know, saying about the, the fee and things. And interestingly, Blues fans have started chanting, what a waste of money every time Stansfield does something good. Um, so, yeah, that, I think that's going to happen throughout this season, isn't it? There's like a, I think there's going to be an, an irony to a lot of the chants that Blues fans sing throughout this season. And uh, Stansfield, yeah, and also, you know, Awata and Peck seem to want to march towards the fans every time one of them scores, which is fantastic as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think Stansfield uh, when he scored that penalty in the shootout against Warsaw, you yeah. know, he, he was cupping his ears in a in a Bristol Street Street yeah. Motors Bristol Street Motors Trophy game, and even back of the first first game of the season when Alfie May scored his penalty, you know, he was giving it the shush to the Reading fans, wasn't he? Yeah. So you know. It's it's fun, you know. I, I I do like it, and it just shows us that there's a bit of defiance and a bit of backbone about these players. Um, going on to the uh, the Stansfield song, the Wacker Wacker. I, I just think it's I think it's brilliant. Mm. Um, would you like to sing it for us if anyone's not heard it? No, go on, Brian. No, I'm not you, singing it. You do. Um, I I wouldn't know all the words yet. To be no, 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 I'm not doing it. Um, but yeah, the you know twenty million down the drain. Jay Stansfield scores again. Or 
some words to that effect. It's absolutely brilliant. You know, one of my favourite songs to come to come out from the uh, away support for a long time, and hopefully we'll hear it a lot more. Uh, we've got quite a few quest- takes and questions. Uh, Alex, do you want to kick us off with some of those? Uh, yes, I can. So first take from Kieran. Uh, thank you, Kieran. Chris Davis has Blues playing the best football at least on a continued basis we have in 20 years. And alongside it being the most effective way to actually win football games, it means Blues are genuinely enjoyable to watch. Still think we're only about 60% right now as well. I, like I think Blues I, I think Blues are more than 60% now. Yeah, I should we, yeah. I mean, we, we had 60%, didn't we, when we initially yeah. discussed it. Should we bump that up a little bit? Where How are you going? I'm at 75, 80 now. Oh, I'm not 80. I, 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 I'm 67.5. <laughs> but you're going low. Uh, no, I'd go 75. I'd go 75. Really? Yeah, I, I think there's still way more to come. You know, some of the players, I don't think Williamson's really hit his stride yet, although we have seen a couple of really good performances. Uh, that 11 had, you know, Alfie May hasn't scored in the last two games. Stansfield, you know, has so much more to come. Iwata genuinely might be the best midfielder outside the Premier League. Uh, Peck hasn't scored yet. You know, Peck's an absolutely sensational player as well. Yeah, there's Ethan Laird to come back. He started the season really well. Christian Bielik didn't play against Rotherham. There's Lee Buchanan to oppose Alex Cochran at left back. That's going to be one hell of a battle. There's so much quality in this in this Blues team and so many players haven't really set the world alight yet and they are going to have moments in the season. Emil Hansen, who's really come into his own the last couple of games, I think, especially at Rotherham. He, I'm expecting him to have a breakout game at some point as well. Yeah, indeed. It would have been great if uh, that shot, did it hit the post or did the keeper? I think it was uh, a save. Yeah, good, good save. Strike. He thought yeah. it was in, you could tell. Yeah, he, and that that's going to be the type of goal he scores, isn't it? Coming mm. inside with, with his right foot. But yeah, I'm encouraged the fact you think Hansen's kicked on a little bit in the last couple of games because he's been the one that's maybe... You know, you've had the question mark over. Um, but, yeah, interesting take from Kieran. Matt Hawkins says, easily the most complete away performance in a few years. Uh, not sure how many more questions this team will need to answer this season. Uh, already already put two of the tricky sides to bed early in this season and before even out of second gear. So, yeah, Matt's, Matt's take is similar, that mm. Blues aren't quite fully in their stride. but. In, in terms of playing at maximum potential, uh, but that they are, you know, dealing with these sides, you know, this run of games, we, we spoke about it beforehand, didn't we? And as, as maybe the acid test for blues, and actually it's a credit to them that the better opposition seems to have brought out better performances in them. And I wonder if that's just the Peck and Iwata com- com- combination. Is that such a, is that, is that the fulcrum of the side? Is that, is that the reason why it seems to be ticking over a bit better? I do think it is such a game changer, Brian, to be honest. I mean, you look at those two players and, and I think we were, we were talking about last week, weren't it? Is there, is there a better midfield pairing outside the Premier League? You know, look at most championship midfield pairings, even the ones at the top end of the league, and I'd have Peck and Iwata over them, to be honest. Um, Iwata's been a, an absolute game changer of a signing. He looks genuinely superb. I don't think he scored many goals for Celtic, but it probably shows the kind of calibre of player he is playing in League One that he's so above the level that he is adding goals straight away. Um, so, so yeah, the Blues look a very, a very good team. What I will say is, you know, I don't think we should sit here and constantly say that Blues are out and getting out of second gear because are we are we expecting Blues to go and win four or five nil every single week. I think those games will come. I think there'll be a few this season where they, they do blow teams away, but I don't think we should like expect it to happen. As long as Blues win and you know, like it against Rotherham, win comfortably, then uh, I think we'll all be happy. Yeah, I wondered if Saturday was actually going to be that day. Actually, mm-hmm. two goals are reasonably early uh, and still creating chances throughout that for the rest of the first half. I wondered if, if there was a four or a five coming. Yeah. There will be some fours and fives, as you, as you say. Um, but, you know, it ended up being just, you know, a really professional mm. and dominant away performance. Just go, going back to Matt's point about... Um, easily the most complete away performance in a few years. I think back to the 5-0 at Luton, which is, I think was August 21, yeah. uh, Lee, Bowie's, Lee Bowie's season. Um, I think this this was more dominant in a way. You know, Blue scored a lot, quite a lot of goals on the counter that day. I remember Chong and Scott Hogan, you know, being given a lot of space in behind Luton. Um, 
so yeah, it, it was it was commanding. You know, it was never in doubt, was it? Really, after after those five first minutes, and I guess that's what Matt's getting at there. Damien Wright, uh, interesting question. This is: Would Jordan James even start in this midfield? Person personally, for me, he wouldn't. Secondly, yes, we have superb players for the level, I, but I believe we have a proper football coach who knows the game really well and a highly intel intelligent in-game manager. I think we hit the jackpot. So. Going to pull two things out of there. JJ, would he get into the starting mm -hmm. midfield? And do we have another Kieran McKenna on our hands here? Uh, I don't think JJ would get into this midfield. Um, I think Awata is a, a better player than JJ at this moment. Obviously, JJ is only 20, so he's got a lot of growth and development to go. He's already a full Wales international, pretty integral for the, for the Wales over the last uh, 12 months. So, you can't knock him and what he's done at that age, but I do think a is a more complete player than Jordan James is. Um, so I don't think he would get into this midfield, no, Brian. Um, not above Peck either? No, definitely not. No. no. I think no. J I've got nothing against JJ. I just never quite felt that he or Blues nailed down the best way to use him. Mm. And I know he, he wanted to be the six. I felt that that, you know, didn't, didn't play to his main strength, which was running with the ball mm -hmm. at his feet. Um, so, yeah, listen, I really hope JJ goes on and has a has a great career. But in terms of you're looking to fit cogs into a machine, then, you know, I, I, I do have some sympathy with Damien's uh, point there. Um, hit the jackpot with Chris Davis. Listen, yes, yes, I guess so. What I would say is he's got the best players in the division. Mm. So is he... Is Chris Davis hitting par at the moment, or is he exceed, is he you know below par to to kind of invert the 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 way it should the way it should be? Is he doing what's expected of him, or is he exceeding expectations, or is he just about you know getting out what getting out of Blues what they should be getting? And I think unless unless Blues did something absolutely exceptional this season, which would be for me to break the league one points record or to, to, I mean, sounds absolutely stupid saying it's six games in, but to go, you know, the season unbeaten or whatever, you know, Chris Davis is probably not onto a winner, I think, because he's, he's going to be expected to take Blues up. He's probably going to be expected to win the league. Anything like, you know, less than promotion is probably going to be deemed as failure. Um, I think he's doing an excellent job so far. I don't think he should be underestimated. The job he had to do during the summer to try and change the style of play and obviously transform the playing squad to players that he wants to work with. Um, to do that in such a short space of time, I think is, you know, really, really, really commendable. Um, I've been really, nothing but impressed by the job that Chris Davis has done. I yeah. think it's a little bit premature to kind of um, make comparisons to Kieran McKenna. Obviously, those comparisons are going to be there because that is quite clearly the route that Knight had have gone down in terms of they've appointed a, a novice manager who's, you know, had a very good career as a coach at the highest level. Um and they've gone down in terms of recruitment, a very data-led approach. So those comparisons between Davis and McKenna are obvious, but I wouldn't be like looking too deeply into the two managers at this moment in time because also they've both had different League One uh, journeys, haven't they? You know, McKenna had players at Ipswich, you know, kept a lot of the players that were there and worked with them. Davis has probably got a very different route in terms of ripping up the squad. So yeah. I think we'll probably judge Chris Davis and a lot of these Blues players a little bit more harshly. Um, you know, I'm going to say it again, but when they're in the championship and you know they're at, they're at a level where you think, okay, now let's see what you're made of. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think he's got Blues moving in the right direction, as you as you say. You know, all the all the signs are, are good. The you can tell the game plans are, are detailed. You can mm. tell that the you know the attacking patterns have been worked on. We know for a fact, you know, they've, they've discussed how they're defending set pieces, how they're playing out. You know, you know, he's been quite open with his with his tactics, hasn't he? And again, he, you know, he revealed to you how important a five yard square pass from Taylor Gardner Hickman was to what was a brilliant assist and lovely finish. It's mm. it's that sort of detail which makes you think, yeah, Chris Davis really does know this game and and he knows knows what he's doing. As we've said so many times, the the tactician side is one element, and the coaching, you know, tracksuit side is is one element. 
the, the manager side is is the other element so but so far so good which brings us on to some questions matthew is there a case that should we be in a positive position come january which i think most believe we will be that blue start bringing in transfers for the championship charge of 25 26. i think troy deeney said something about this um over the weekend that uh, blues in january would be recruiting you know top end championship players to go again you know back to back so you know we really are in a world where we're putting the cart before the horse and then the next cart before the next cart before the next horse a little bit aren't we aren't we but yeah certainly knighthead have made no secret of their ambition to bring players in that are too good for this competition yeah i thought in the summer blues would be kind of going for those low-end championship players but you know there are probably five or six players in this blue squad that i think are already high-end championship you look at the yeah. team of field players you look at jay stansfield you look at willemson um you look at clara Bielik, the they, they're blues I've, I've literally just named the spine of the team haven't i blues have got the spine of a champ a very very good championship team i think yeah so, oh sorry go on no, they, they have. So it would just be about adding players around it. I don't think we're necessarily going to see Blues go out and target players for the championship promotion push in January because I think they've already started doing that, haven't they? They've signed players on contracts of three and four years. They want this squad, the bulk of this squad. And that's actually what Tom Wagner said to me when I interviewed him before the Wrexham game, that we hope this these guys will be good enough to achieve our objectives. But obviously, if we need to add to it, the money will be made available. So they clearly think they've got a squad that can kind of not go back to back, but can go up and compete straight away. Yeah, I said a few games ago that I think I could see Mark Leonard playing in the Premier League for Blues. He's not even in the team at the moment. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, they are looking to take people with them, aren't they? You know, mm. it's not just a case of we'll buy a team for League One, then we'll buy another team for the Championship, and then hopefully in the Premier League we'll, we'll start again. Signings like Iwata and, and Peck, who's obviously been brought in uh, earlier than this season, and, and Mark Leonard and Clara. You know, somebody said to me the other day that there are championship clubs already looking at Clara. You know, those sorts of signings, they're, they're, they're made to go all the way, aren't they? They are, yeah, definitely. I mean, Yokoyama and uh, Iwata in the interview they did with Blues TV a couple of weeks ago, they were asked for their kind of aims and objectives for their time at Blues, and they both just said Premier League, so... You know, that the Blues have built a squad that is going to be capable of getting there. They, it's just going to need, like every team needs in the summer months, just tweaks here and there to make it better. Yeah, so Matthew, I, I think that process has started already to answer Matthew's mm -hmm. question. Darren Poynton, how integral is Willemson? Don't start me off again, Darren. <laughs> As part of the core of the team now, strength, quality, vision and movement is improving all the time. It looks a tall order for Luke Harris to get back in once fit. Um. Willemson. Yeah, we've spoken a little bit about Willemson, but talk about the the balance with Luke Harris because Davis really does like him, doesn't he? Yeah, so I, I could actually see both of them fitting in the same team the way Davis is using Willemson at the moment because he's obviously using him off the right-hand side, isn't he, and letting him come inside when Blues are in possession, which, let's face it, as we said before, is most of the game. Um, Willemson seems to be working quite well in that role, even in, like, in terms of defensive aspect, tracking back and supporting the right-back. He has been doing it really well, so um, I think there's not, it's, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that, that Williamson and Harris can play together. We mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned Davis on Harris. He, after the Wickham game when Harris scored, Davis kind of basically said, I want to get him in positions where he can score goals because he has that knack. Um, he's done it right throughout his youth career and will do it for us. So, yeah, I, I, I think Harris will play a lot as well. I think Williamson, on the form that he's shown at the moment, has to play most weeks. His ability suggests that he has to play most weeks. Um, but I think Harris will get a, a lot of game time. and It wouldn't surprise me if they played in the same team a lot of the time as well. But again, that, that leads you to the, the one of, is it Alfie May who has to drop out of the 11? If Harris and Williamson play, then probably yes. Great problems sorry. to have, though, Brian. Yeah, sorry. I was just doing a little bit of research on, on the next <laughs> question. Uh yeah, the only sort of thing I would add to that is that players that come in on loan have probably been had their parents' club told that they're going to play. So, mm. yeah, I've, listen, it goes back to what we've been we say all the time: is plenty of football. 
assuming assuming blues get through their bristol street motors group they almost kind of need to don't they just to make make sure that there, there is enough football to go around um uh paul can you see blues offering peck a new contract in january a lot of interest in the summer which there was a clear class above at this level and possibly even the level above yes at the level above as well uh in the championship new contract so i was just checking i didn't know off the top of my head uh when his contract expires but he's got 26. another 2026 yeah mm -hmm. uh so he's we, we get into 18 months aren't we and good football clubs do do that sort of sort of succession planning or the taking care of housekeeping i suppose it, it, it is a better term for it don't they um, yeah so yeah probably something that needs to be talked about i would say no i'd imagine it probably will be to be honest because i spoke to chris davis actually pre rolton about peck and kind of just talking about like how did you convince him to stay in the summer was it easy and he said that i was pretty insistent all the way along that he was a player that i wanted to keep um which you know it says a lot about pep because he didn't want to keep many players judging by how many uh, how many of the blues let blues let go in the summer so so he clearly really rates him highly um you know he started every single game this season in the league at least um so yeah chris davis is going to want to keep peck and peck's going to be a championship midfielder isn't he he already is so he's a player that again one that blues can carry if they do want to go all the way through to the premier league yeah i wonder if just for insurance purposes you know they give it till march or april or something like that and see where they are in a league position or, yeah. or maybe peck might peck might want to hold yeah. them just yeah. to make sure that they you know the 25 26 season is going to be a championship campaign um yeah. But yes, certainly something that needs looking at, Paul. That's a well-highlighted point. Uh, Max, can you see us struggling to hold on to any of the players in January? Or do you think anyone has brought in enough to want to stay for the whole journey? What's your response to that? Um, I, you know what? I think you'll probably get a few who haven't played enough between the start of the season in January who will look to go out in January. There's, there's always that, isn't it? When you've got a squad that's as strong as Blues, there are going to be a few who are fringe players who are probably going to have to be let go and replaced. Um, but in terms of the players that are in the first eleven that are key to Chris Davis' plans, I think Blues are, are more than capable of hanging on to them, aren't they? they? These players have joined Blues knowing what division they are in and yeah. knowing where they want to go. So they're not going to check out in January as long as they're, you know, firm pictures in the eleven, which the ones that are Chris Davis will want to keep. Yeah, I think you're right. The key players, guys like Clara, haven't mm -hmm. uprooted their families and come to Blues in League One and go, oh, hang on, this is the third tier. You know, I want to be playing at a higher level. That they are, they've got in, or they've started to climb the ladder on the bottom rung, haven't they? Uh, so, yeah, as you say, may, maybe some of the players that aren't aren't getting the the first team football at the moment, but the, the key guys like Peck and Clara, I would imagine, I find it very difficult if they suddenly decide, you know, six months in, oh, I fancy a crack at the championship now. Um, do you think? Do you think there's any? Max goes on to say, do you think there's any positions we need strengthening in general? Um, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't, I, the only the only one for me that I think there's still the question mark, not necessarily this season because Blues have got an excellent goalkeeping department for this season. But, you know, if they get to the championship, uh, Peacock, Farrell and Allsop, are they, is one of them going to be the goalkeeper to be if you're a team that wants to compete right at the top end of the championship? That's the only question mark for me. Peacock, Farrell's had a bit of a, a shaky start, hasn't it? I think he's the goalkeeper that Blues believe can develop with them. Um, I think we need to just kind of see him progress over this season to kind of make us a bit more confident that he's the goalkeeper that can help Blues win promotion to the Premier League. He was better at the weekend, wasn't he? He was, yeah, he was. He was yeah. much better and much more confident. You could tell that Rodham had watched the Wrexham game, watched the, the corners yeah. being dumped on top of his head and, and did a couple of them, and he dealt with them much better. He's much stronger. So, uh, so yeah, he's, it was a, a morale-boosting clean sheet for him, I would say. Yeah. I've put one in, a question here on the running order. might be putting you on the spot in a little bit unfair, uh, and I almost can't pronounce the the Twitter handle other than to say it's Blue Nose backwards. Uh, Blue Nose in brackets backwards has um as i said sports quarter stadium plans delta airlines undefeated night details night deals sorry any news on anything that we may not know that's happening i've put you on the spot there um what i would say is 
I mean, I, I haven't got any news on negotiations or talks with, with anybody else, have you? No, not on, not on that. I, I, the interesting point I've taken from, from this question is actually the Blues documentary. I don't think that's actually set in stone, is it? I think we just kind of all presume it will happen because every time I've seen Tom Brady at at, uh, at St Andrews, he's followed by a, a you know team of film a film crew and cameras and things. And, you know, interestingly, when we were all doing those interviews before the Wrexham game, uh, I think one of the uh, the one of the the film crew kind of uh, convinced Christian Bielik to to throw the the American football in Bailey um, in Brady's direction. Next thing you know, Bielik's running to halfway line, um, cutting Richard Wilford of BBC WM's interview, and Brady is there throwing a pass to him. So Bielik actually didn't 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 catch the pass, which uh, which wasn't very impressive to be honest. It would have been worse if he'd rolled his ankle or something. But thankfully, he didn't. He was fine. Um, but yeah. Um, there's obviously the, the potential for that there or something, you know, a phrase a YouTube channel or something now, hasn't he? So I'd imagine there'll be details of his Blues involvement on there. I think it's all just about raising the profile of the club, isn't it? You know, it can't be a bad thing to have David Beckham at a game and have him talking about Blues the following down Champions League coverage. Um, yeah. Can't be a bad thing for Brady to have a YouTube channel and be talking about his visit to St Andrews on it. So um, anything that raises the profile of the club is, you know, knighted are clearly all four and, you know, we're clearly quite behind as well because it means that blues are getting bigger and hopefully the podcast gets bigger as well <laughs> yeah and tom if you're listening i'm quite happy for us to become the night head right on <laughs> podcast if you, you you can be the k of the keep right on podcast <laughs> if you want um yeah uh blue nose backwards goes on to say he can't wait to hear see the plans for the delta Airlines city of birmingham stadium at night head park <laughs> just got a cold commercial shudder down my uh, spine there but you know that that's fine if it brings money into the club i suppose it'll sell a bit more of the soul um <laughs> uh, jack haycock do we have any idea when the exeter game in hand will be scheduled uh, i don't, I don't think, know i don't um, think that's been sorted yet and there'll be another one coming up i would imagine is it the cambridge game which is likely to be rearranged yes is that on the 12th that is the 12th isn't i think it? so yeah 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 so both probably yeah blues are always going to have the international breaks aren't they because they've got enough players so so yeah um, it's going to be quite a congested, congested fixture this second half of the season, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so, yes, Jack, when there's, when there's news, we'll obviously bring it to you. Uh, Stevie Lou, I'm loving life as a Blues fan and there's absolutely nothing to complain about. However, uh, I'm going to find something. Is it wrong to have a slight worry that despite our near 70% possession in every game, we don't create that many chances? It's a fair point, yeah. It is a fair point. And I was I was yeah. thinking about this in the way up to Rotherham. Um it's not they've had a lot of the ball and it's not like they've been banging on the door of opponents for for 70, 80 minutes in a game. Against Wrexham, they're very good. Didn't create a, an awful lot out of the goals they scored, to be fair. Um the most dominant, you know, I've seen I've seen blues this season was their final, you know, stoppage time against Regin when they literally were absolutely banging on the door to score a second goal after Alfie May had scored from the penalty spot. So um, they've got it in them to really dominate teams and create chances. We just have, we've seen it in more control this season. They seem so kind of uh, set in the system and, and set in working through the, working through the thirds in a, in a particular way. They they don't really batter teams as, as, as much, I wouldn't say. They're quite actually mm. respectful and don't go and kill teams four or five, four, four, oh. four, five nil. Um, don't be, don't be giving me that. Don't, don't be giving me the Steve Cottrell. Line. Remember away at Sheffield Wednesday. I think it was around one Christmas time, so it would have been 2017. I'm going to say um, Sheffield Wednesday had two players sent off. Blues won three one quite comfortably, and uh, Steve Cottrell came out with the, we we didn't run the score up. Out of <laughs> Uh, no, run the score up, please. Run the score up. Um, we'll, we'll deal with the loss of respect. Um, sorry, I interrupted you there. No, uh, they, they are, you, are you done? No, they, they just they haven't created a, a shed load of chances, have they, in games? Uh, I think that's something that will come, hopefully. Um, but they're taking the ones they do create at least, which is a, which is a positive sign. If we'd have done better preparation, we could have come up with the XG figures for the um, for the league, couldn't we? Um, uh, Langen, L Langen, 198. Uh, how many games spared do you think we'll win the league by? I'll leave this to you, Alex, when we go up dicking. Uh, that's a great question. 
Um, and I don't think about it, which shows I'm taking it seriously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I do think, I do think, I'll be honest, I do think Blues will win the league. I, I think there'll be games. I don't think they'll go the season and beat, and I think that's kind of wishful thinking. I think there'll be games where they'll lose. Uh, you did float that in your in your quotes in your comment piece, though, didn't you? You did well, float. You you were the first person I've seen. Maybe no, I've, I've talked no. about it on Twitter. No, oh. okay, first time I've seen it in print. Then maybe. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? You you just got to think. They've got a manager who's so kind of switched on and serious, and will not let any manager at this level outwit him. Um, they've got a group of players that are ridiculously good for this level. It's going to be an absolute hell of a shock when they do lose a game. You know because. They're better than every team at this level. They could, they could go away to chart in a few weeks and, and lose 1-0, having had 70% possession and 45 shots. But, you know, there could be a game like that where they just simply cannot score and cannot finish all their chances. But, um, but you know, if, if everything goes to plan and Blues play players they should each week and Chris Davis isn't the sort of person who's going to let standards slip, then what's to say they can't? Go a season and beat, and you know, you know, most managers would shut you down if you talk about that. But Chris Davis has experienced it before when he was at Celtic, and they went sixty-nine games and beat them domestically, um, and went an entire season and beat and won the treble. So, you know, it can happen. I'm not, I'm not saying it would. I don't think Blues will go a season and beat, and I think that is really wishful thinking in a forty-six game League One season. But um, you know, it could happen, Brian. It's not, it's not impossible, is it? It's, it's, uh, listen, I suppose you, they go into every game and you expect them to yeah. win or not lose at all, don't you? Be a real, yeah, you, you don't expect them to lose. They extrapolate that over the, the next 40 games. Yes, I suppose. In theory, it is possible. You are going to be have so much egg on your face uh, if, if Blues don't go up. Um, <laughs> but no, you're offering opinion and we, we applaud you for that. Uh, I've just, just picked... Another question that's not on the not on the running order. Uh, you can get stuck into this one as well. Uh, it's it's from someone who's a Lee C nineteen ninety six who's changed his Twitter handle to League One Champions twenty twenty five, and he's asked us. But realistically, what do you both think our chances of breaking Wolves points record this season? So that that's a reference to the Wolves promotion side. Of, I think twenty fourteen. Yeah, 13-14. Um, yeah. They, how many points was it? 103? 103, yeah. 103, okay. Re realistic chances of, of breaking that record? I mean, if I remember correctly from that season, Wolves weren't, didn't fly out the blocks, uh, whereas Blues have. Mm. So, you know, there's half a chance that Blues can do it, I think. Um, I think most most pundits are expecting Blues to do it, put that pressure on Blues. Um I think we spoke before the season. It normally takes 100 points to win the league, doesn't it, in League One? Yeah, and exactly. It has yeah. pretty much over the last few seasons. You know, the team that's won it has got close to 100 points or exceeded 100 points in the in the case of Plymouth Argyle. So, um, yeah, I, I think Blues probably will go through 100 points if they are to win the league. Um, and 104 from 100 isn't a lot, is it? So it's only a couple of games, a couple of wins. So they could do it. They could do it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think so. I I think they'll actually be quite hard pushed. You know, the Plymouth um, title that you made reference to, you know, Ipswich and Sheffield Wednesday were both in the high 90s, weren't they? Mm. So it was, a, it was a case of you cannot blink, you have to win, mm. uh, which then informs the tactical decisions and, and how, you know, ambitiously you set up uh, because you need to keep winning. Um, so if Blues have someone to push them, then yeah, it's it's not out of the question. I mean, I'm getting I'm getting into it now that they really? they could hit three figures. Yeah, who is the team, Brian? Who's who's jumping out at you? The team that could push them because I, I mean, Wrexham are always still top of the league. We must remember that. But Wrexham have, having watched them aren't aren't the team that I think are going to push Blues all the way. I would have said Stockport until Saturday. Um, <sighs> Huddersfield till Saturday as well. They got yeah they got Hud yeah. At home, didn't they? I mean, Peterborough as well. You know, I thought mm. I think. Peterborough have been around this particular block several times. Wouldn't surprise me if they're the ones to to really push Blues to the very end. I mean, my preseason tip was Wigan. I can't even, I'm not even sure where Wigan are in the league now. Um, let me just have a. He was trip. mine. I went Charlton, didn't I? Charlton. You did. You did go Charlton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a sort. Yeah. Uh, let me just see. I'll embarrass myself. Wigan are. Yeah, let's not do that. Uh, they're, 14, they're, they're 14th. Charlton oh. are fourth. We um, went to Rotherham, though, as well, didn't we? We both went to Rotherham, so we're both looking a bit silly there. But 
Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, that will happen. Interesting you say Wrexham aren't the side that you think will push Blues. Um, I thought Blues handled them so comfortably that I, I'd be inclined to agree with that. Barnsley, you know, mm. maybe by maybe courtesy of, you know, it seems they seem to very, be very strong at home. Uh, I'd I would if the question is has has the sort of has the leading contender emerged out of the pack with Blues? Yeah, I don't think so. Quite, mm. there's no one that's in massively rampant form, and Blues just do seem to be rolling on. I suppose you know Wrexham are the league leads, and we have to give them some respect. So, which brings us on to our final point. Um, so many uh, responses to our Christoph Dugary giveaway in our last podcast podcast thank you so much for your interest uh in that uh really great to be able to offer a couple of prizes we have picked two winners uh we won't name them just yet um but we will name them in the next show uh, and we will be in touch so a couple of christoph dugary signed posters will be winging their way to uh to well-deserving blue noses alex anything else once I've run down to the uh, the local cop to photocopy those uh, those do Gary posters, then uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try not to smudge it when you're signing it this time as well. Um, no, no, that's no. They, they are authentic. No, they, uh, they are. They are definitely authentic. Yeah, um, yeah. I wish we keep them. Um, yeah, no, Brian, I'm good. Everything's done. I think we've uh, we've we've wrapped up. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, which all that remains for me to say is thank you, Alex, for your time. Thank you all for listening and uh, keep practicing that Jace Stansfield song and it's a keep right on from both of us.